Hello, good afternoon. This is Sunday, the 11th of July, the day that hopefully England bring home the World Cup. So I've tossed off my New Forest Morse t shirt, Adam. <laughs> In fact, I've borrowed Adam's England top, which I lent him. <laughs> this goes back probably to the, uh, <laughs> the Euros 2000, and uh, I think 1996 might be even the. <laughs> you could go back, it's quite an old t shirt, isn't it? And I'm sure a lot of you are probably struggling to get hold of um, English tops. I know that uh, they all sold out when uh, England got into the final. So tonight at 8 o'clock, uh, we're going to hopefully be celebrating a victory over Italy, my second team. I'm half Italian, and uh, I have an Italian t-shirt that I might put on if Italy win, but we'll uh, stick with this one for now. I hope that England do the business. But I wanted to, to just show you how beautiful this girl is. This is Sif, and she is a VPI Lightning Pied, which is an Exantic Pied. And she was one of my problem feeders that we had. Um, we've had her for nearly 12 months and she hadn't eaten for quite a long time. And it turns out over the last three weeks now, she took uh, two multis and she then shed out and missed last week. But this week, she's took another multi, which Jared fed before he took off for his little vacation. And he was delighted because he was so pleased that um, she was able to start feeding on a more regular basis so well done little Sif. Now I wanted to show you something on her that I hadn't noticed before but can you see that beautiful black patch? So she shed out recently and she's given us a new black patch. Can you see it? It's what you'd get on a panda pied. So she's just absolutely gorgeous. I mean she's got beautiful colours, beautiful animal, really really pleased with her and she's got that lovely dark black head and those striking colours. Just look at the greys, the whites and the blacks. She really is a beautiful animal. And she's starting to put on weight, which is so important. So hopefully, if she carries on feeding, give her another 18 months or so. Um, hopefully she'll be over three years old, hopefully big enough. And uh, we'll put her to her husband, Thor, who's up there, who's ready to go. He's 894 grams, so we can start breeding with him but we'll obviously give her a chance to carry on feeding. But I just thought I'd share that little mini success with you on the feeding side. While I slip her back, I just wanted to show you what also I'm doing, um, which is we've got um, another solution to help Queenie. Queenie was one of our problem feeders, which is just over here, Adam. Uh, she's down here at the moment. Now she's a pastel clown that we imported, she came with a, a problem. So what I've done is I've done a couple of things. We've given her an extra water bowl uh, last week and she showed an interest in the multi but didn't take it, which means that humidity is improving. But now I'm gonna help her by giving her a new substrate. And what I've invested in, and I'll show you this new um, reptile substrate. It's right here. And um, it's called Coco Bedding. And it's a company called Petex, which Jared managed to order some of this online. And it looks high quality, clean cocoa husk in there. And it's 100% natural, nothing's added to it. It's only um, from sustainable sources. So we like the fact that it's from sustainable sources. It's a substrate available for all types of reptiles. It's absorbent and it's biodegradable. So once it's been completed, we can put it on the garden and help to uh, recycle it into our garden compost it stimulates natural digging and burrowing behavior and I think when I show you Queenie you'll see that she's been digging into it and quite rooting it and enjoying it it smells lovely as well it absorbs waste and it controls odors which is we'll test that out so I've only just put her in there today and it's also used for decorative purposes so that's the one that we've used it has all the instructions on the back how to use it and effectively I've um, I think I've put they say you've put between three and five centimeters in the rub and then spray it down with water to get to also holds the humidity so i'm also using a bigger water bowl but i'm using the substrate to give her a more natural feel but also to allow her to burrow to get comfortable to absorb all her um, odors and give her hopefully a, a more enjoyable experience and be interested to see next week when i feed her whether she takes food if she does we could be close to cracking this one. So one thing at a time, I haven't moved up to a larger rub yet and I haven't given her a big hide yet. That's my next step. So I'm just going through all the different 
feeding issues and hopefully we'll be able to nail it. So hopefully the better humidity and the substrate. Do you want to have a quick look at her, Adam, and see how we go? Adam's our photographer for the day. And let's have a little look at her. She's probably made a bit of a mess, but if you come around this side, Adam, that's it. Shine her in this way. Let's slowly open her up and see how what she's getting up to. Now look, there she is. got her head forward, she's enjoying her body on the substrate, and look, she's in striking position. <laughs> That's a good sign, Adam. It's almost as though, come on, you can feed me now, I'm happy. Now, I haven't got a food defrosted for her, but you can see she's in strike position. If I get the hook, then on her to strike me. But that's a good sign. It's the first time she's got in a strike position for ages. She's only been in there about an hour. The new substrate, and look at the position she's in. She's saying, oh, thank you, my darling. Please feed me now, hopefully. And now let's have a little look at her and see how she's enjoying her, her new home. Now to me, that's the best I've seen her looking at them. Now how do you think, compared to last week when you helped me, do you think she's in a, a better state? Does yeah. she look healthier to you? Mm -hmm. And she looks like she's ready to take some food, but I'm not gonna give her food because I'm gonna give her some food in a couple of days once she's settled into the substrate. So give her a chance to adjust to a new humidity, a new substrate. But she looks like she's in a coiled position, wanting to eat there, Adam. So I think this could be a really good step forward. And I'm gonna, look, 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 as I put my hand down, see, did you see how she moved her head towards me? As though she wanted to strike my hand. I just put her back, but she's looking a whole lot better. So I'm well pleased with that. And the other top tip, Adam, I wanted to give um, our viewers with the feeding process, which I didn't cover last time because we got to part two, didn't get to part three because the battery ran out, <laughs> is um, I wanted to discuss how to become laser focused on some of the problem feeders. So what happens with a big collection? Jad and I feed once a week and sometimes we get a bit tired at the end of the process because there's so many animals to feed. So you could split up the feeding process over several days but we like to try and get our collection all synced because they all poo together, they all clean together, they all, so we get a nice, so we like to try and feed everything in one day. But I've been thinking about this and realizing that when you get to your problem feeders, you're a little bit tired, but you know, you've gone through a lot of animals, you're kind of hoping that you can just heat the head, feed them, they move on. But in actual fact, we ourselves get a little bit tired and we don't necessarily give the patience and laser focus to the animals that need it. So what I thought I'd do is the following day, I made a list of all the problem feeders, or those that didn't take, and I pu pulled out some small rats and I pulled out some Maltese, and I think I only pulled out 10 animals, 10, 10 prey items. And I let them defrost and I let the smell permeate through the whole system. Now to my amazement, because this is the first time I've done that, to feed the next day on the problem feeders, is that all the other animals that fed the day before, that could smell the food in, the facility, there's an awful lot of other animals that were gagging for a sec for second helpings, <laughs> which um, I resisted. And I thought, no, I'm gonna use these um, prey items to feed um, the animals that um, were problem feeders, but also I had a, I, I ran out of a couple of rats as well. So there was two or three other animals that I hadn't fed. So I got some extra rats out to give the other ones food that didn't get a chance because we, I think with all the girls now coming off their eggs and now they're feeding, I underestimated how many um, rats I needed and some of these girls are starting to get ferocious again. So uh, the number of um, animals that I need to feed each week is going up. So what I did is I decided to focus on a couple of males that actually left food. Now you know the next day when you've fed animals, you come into your facility and you clean and you find the odd animals left a rat. It struck, it coiled, and you thought it was gonna eat it, but it actually left it. And I hate to see that because you can't uh, reuse them. They, they tend to go into the bin. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to represent another food item to them to see whether they'd take it a second time. And the two boys that left their food was Apollo, which is the banana super pastel, who's in here now. And here he is, he's in his little hide. He's now shed out. Um, I gave him another multi and he took it the next day and he, and he retained it without leaving it. So I thought that was interesting. So that tells me that maybe he didn't get the head in the right position and maybe just left it. 
and maybe he when he struck it and the same with um the joker boy the clown when he struck it he didn't strike the head he might have struck the side or the back end of the animal so i think sometimes food items get left not because they don't want to eat them it's because they, unless they hit them in the heads they get cold they can't maneuver them necessarily some of them are a bit fussy they just leave them so joker was the other one that i gave the item to and you can see here he has eaten his multi and he's got a meal in him now had i not done a second day feed and re-present he may have gone another week without food so i'm quite pleased with this idea so the idea is maybe don't feed all your animals all on the same day and even the ones that leave prey items go the next day reheat up a smaller prey item present it as correctly as you can with it so they take it by the head and see if the ones that have left food actually retain it and the other good news which i learned was there was a, an animal that's been a long-term problem feeder for us which was number four if you come over here Adam, it's this one here her name is terry now she is a uh, female orange dream het russo 50% het pie she's beautiful and we called her terry because she looks like a terry's that no, no, she wants to feed again see how she was out for food there you see that Adam? now she hadn't eaten for probably the best part of 12 weeks and i went and presented a multi to her uh, made sure that the multi's head was very hot she struck the head and she completely ate the prey item and it was just because I gave her a smaller multi, a greater heat on the head, and laser focus on her. And she took a while to take it. I had to stimulate her, so she was showing an interest. She started to tongue flick her, and then I moved the prayer around to give the impression that it's a live animal. And then she didn't take it, so I reheated the head, boiled the kettle again, made sure it was super hot, dipped the head in again, went back to her, and she nailed it. And I was so happy. So. I think what we've got here is some of the animals that we have down as perhaps potentially short-term to medium-term non-eaters, a lot of it is really, could be us. I mean, it could be us ourselves. It could be that we're tired, that we're not giving them enough focus, that we're not making adjustments, that we're not heating the prey as hot as they want it. We're not being patient with them without forcing on them. So I'm, I'm learning a little bit about how we can unlock some of the problem feeders. The other thing I was going to mention is um, when it comes to long-term non-feeders, there could be other reasons why animals don't feed. And it could be that there, um, there could be mites in a facility. And when a snake is actually covered in mites or has a few mites, it can go off feeding. So if you've got an animal that isn't feeding, I would inspect it very carefully. I'd look at its scales, look at its rub, see whether there's any mites that have gone in there because that can sometimes put them off. Um, so that's another thing to check and once you uh, we have a video put out on how to eliminate mites Once you've eliminated the mites and they feel less irritated by them unless they get, they get de-stressed They'll then go back onto feeding again So it could be that there might be a mite issue and the other long-term health issue That is always a very difficult one is that we noticed that when we imported a snake last year one of them was given to us with an RI issue and it went off food and it went off food for a long time and we treated it, tried to nurse it, tried to get it back to health and um, it just wouldn't eat because its health was, uh, it was so poorly and unfortunately uh, no matter how much we try to help it, it didn't actually make it in the end and we lost that snake um, but I do know from other people, um, particularly a few friends in the industry who have overcome RI issues and they've explained to me this, that once they've um, improved the RI condition of their snakes they haven't actually um, they found that their appetite comes back even when they are still recovering from RI and I think it's a wise thing to do is that once a snake with RI who's been off food is starting to improve its condition it's worth offering a prey item to it because obviously a snake needs to keep its strength going while it's being nursed back to strength so you probably give it a small prey item and so again you need to take veterinary advice on that but normally I would say that if you have a snake which has gone off food uh, it's worth actually getting a credit card. Now, I think we've got one, and we did have one in here. Um, you basically slip the credit card or the card under the mouth of the snake, open up and see whether there's any excess saliva, or if it's blowing bubbles, or if it's starting to wheeze. These are all possible reasons why a snake might not be eating. It may have an RI issue that you don't know about. 
And I'd always say good practice is that when you're buying a snake, it's worth inspecting the snake very carefully because a lot of RI issues can be hidden. Um, where you say import a snake in from another country, you're relying on the breeder to confirm that he's clean of RI. And then when it comes, you find out it's got an RI issue. Um, that's why it's always best if you can to go and meet the owner and visit with the snake and actually do a full inspection before you commit uh, to buy the snake. So there's a couple of other additional points on the feeding side is that sometimes feeding can be turned off because of RI issues, could be scale rot issues, there could be a whole bunch of other issues that the snake has. If it's pooing very badly, so it's a squidgy poo, it's got diarrhea. Diarrhea obviously is an indicator that the snake is ill, then I think it's worth taking your snake to a vet and getting it treated and maybe if it's suffering with a diarrhea issue you may want to reduce the prey size down maybe go for a higher quality food item which are multi tends to be higher quality whereas the other rats in my experience we had a girl that had a diarrhea issue and we moved her across to multis and the diarrhea issue went away and she got back to health again so it could be that her diet she might be used to a certain diet you might be used to multis maybe she can't handle the other rats so you have to kind of experiment. It might be that they're better off with mice. So it's just like humans, really, that, you know, depending on what you're eating determines how you're feeling inside. And maybe not to overfeed as well so that they got time to digest correctly and they're not ending up. Um, and also diarrhea is a sign of the animal being unhealthy or stressed out. So okay, husbandry needs to be checked. You need to make sure the environment it's in is healthy and clean. Um, so there's a few other pointers to help you with any feeding issues. So the next thing I wanted to cover now, Adam, is um, we're going to be doing some more um, breeding, but I wanted to give you an update on two of the girls that I thought would give us clutches, and we got two slugged out clutches this week. One of them was from Ray, and I just wanted to share her a moment. She's in here. She was getting into position to lay. She laid us um, a clutch of slugs and unfortunately she gave us eight good eggs last year and she gave us eight slugs this year now we're going to focus on getting a rebuilt but the question i need to ask myself is why did she give us eight slugs so it could be a number of things did we get our temperatures right i believe we did did we put an, the male into her that was a, a, a viable male that had sperm and producing good sperm now we thought we did but i've just been checking the record and i noticed that she didn't receive as many locks as she did in the previous year. And this is one of the dangers of actually having a larger collection where you're spreading your boys more thinly over your girls, is also the boys' um, sperm count can drop off. So even though she did lock a couple of times, which she thought would be, should be enough, I believe that she produced healthy eggs, but she didn't have the right level of sperm in her to actually make those eggs fertile. So I think we've got infertile eggs that slugged out, not because she wasn't in good condition, because she was two and a half thousand kilograms and she was pounding food and she looked really healthy. I think it's because there was a fertility issue, which I think it may be that we maybe overstretch some of our males to more females. And maybe next year you can learn from that and say, okay, what we do is we've got some more boys that have grown up. We'll spread the sperm count more carefully and make sure she's getting the right locks at the right time <clears throat> and to help that one. Now the other one, that's interesting, two of our Pied projects slugged out on us, so that was Ray. The other one over here was um, Buttercup. Now she gave us four beautiful eggs last year. She gave us five this time, but they're all slugs. And there she is. <coughs> she's obviously gonna start recovering, but she is a yellow belly pastel hide and she's very uh, low white so clutches 15 and 16 both slugged out on us so sometimes you get successes sometimes you doesn't doesn't always happen but the key is that we learn from this and again I think the same problem again is I didn't put enough healthy males to her that were full of sperm I think I overstretched my pied boy too much and I think they didn't lock enough and I don't think the sperm count was as strong and I think that's the reason why I believe those two girls slugged out on us. So next year, I'm gonna be laser focused. We've got some beautiful other pieds coming up and I'll just show you, we've got Wizzy, who's a grown baby in here, who's gonna be ready to breed. And it's not that one actually, it's the one over here, sorry, it'll be that one there. So he is a yellow belly pumpkin pie. 
uh, he's in the middle of shed you can see I've dampened him now but you'll see he will then be one of our future breeding boys he weighs a thousand grams at the moment so he's big enough to breed with and he is 12 months old but by the time we use him Adam will probably be he'll be about 18 months old so sexually mature so we'll probably use him to help to carry the workload of Elvis and maybe lighten the Elvis's workload out for us a little bit, just lower his workload. And the other um, male we've got is Thor. Now this is our lightning pipe boy, he's 900. So we'll be using him as a, in our pipe projects. So you can see all these males, pipe males, are going to be worth their weight in gold. And we'll be using him. And that leads me nicely onto the Dream School boy, who's in Shed, who's now weighing 1350 grams, Bowser. He'll be put to quite a few of the pied and het pied girls um, later this year. And you'll see he's in a deep shed at the moment. I'll just show you how he's looking. So he's a really big, healthy boy. So Elvis, we've got the troops come and help you. So we've got all these beautiful pied girls that we want to be able to breed with. And I think we've got an army of boys to help us with that now. Because I think the key is to, to make sure you've got enough boys so that all the hard work you put into your projects, you don't end up being slugged out because of lack of fertility, but you've got strong locks with boys that have been carefully spread over the breeding rotation. Now that leads me nicely on to uh, whether we're going to continue pairing for the rest of the year. Now I thought that we were going to ease up a little bit, but as I today, after I cleaned, I decided just to check to see which girls need another lock. And you'll see over here, we've got Penelope, which is our pinstripe. She's nearly 3,000 kilograms. She's just going into a shed at the moment. And we need to put Apollo to her one more time. Now I've rested Apollo for the last six to eight weeks and now he's eating food. He weighs about 1,100 grams. We'll get that super pastel banana orange dream to her to produce some amazing combos, hopefully. And then the other one is Panda. Now both these girls are still pounding food. So let's have a little look and see how a panda girl is doing. Now she is coming up to nearly 3,000 kilograms as well, uh, 3,000 grams, 3 kilograms. And she will need another lock. So again, Apollo is his job to take cover these two girls. If for any particular reason he's not up for the job, then we may decide to use one of our high-end boys, whether it's Thor, whether it's Bowser, or our dreams are cool, and maybe produce some double heads with these extra codons in, is my other possibility. So, there will be a bit more breeding going on. Also, Amber, who's going into shed, you'll see just how many animals are in shed at the moment. Because the humidity is going really well in the facility, we've got like 55 to 60% humidity. She's nearly 3,000 grams as well, Adam. And, She's in blue at the moment, but after she sheds out, I'm going to put the clown boy to her to hopefully get some more clown eggs. So that's the plan on that one. And we also have some other females that have come up to size, which I want to show you. And I've got one over here, which is uh, Tinker. And I just weighed her today. She's 100% het pied. And just look at the size of her. She weighs nearly 1,880 grams. So she's well big enough to put one of our pied boys to. And I'm thinking seriously, once the Dream School boy shed out, I may put the Dream School boy to her so that we get another clutch of double heads or visual pieds, which are 100% head for um, uh, lavender albino. So there's another possibility. So we're finding there's quite a few girls the other one that's come up to size is Lala, and she is a super pastel, 100% het pie. So really focusing on the pie projects. Now, because she's carrying super pastel, um, we might put Thor to her, because Thor is an exantic pied. So we'll end up with a pastel pied that's 100% het for exantic VPI. And the idea is pastel VPI pieds are beautiful, Adam. And because she's super pastel, it makes sense to maybe put Thor, the um, lightning pied, to her to produce a guaranteed pastel pied 100% head for VPI Exantic. So that makes sense. So 
there's quite a few things that you know you think you're at the end of your breeding season in reality there's still some things that you can twig and adjust that you need to keep focused Adam's given me a five minute countdown on the video so let's just see if there's any other things that I wanted to cover um, let me have a little look I've covered that oh grow-ons so in um, our next video we've got uh, some clutches I was going to show you a quick update on how clutch 3 is doing maybe we can do that and then we've got another egg cut clutch number four cutting in about six days on the 17th so I'll just show you how these ones are doing they're coming out of their eggs now these these are the um, desert ghost we had 10 eggs that we cut early this two days ago and you'll see that they're starting to come out of their eggs now in fact can you see Adam we got one two three three out and two still in and you can see they're still in shed but we'll give you a full update when they all come out and shed out and we'll do a proper ID on those so that's a quick update on those and I think what I'll do is uh, stick these back in the incubator just have a look at the other five I think the other five have come out as well or starting to come out see if these ones are coming out of their eggs looks like they are let's have a wee look so how many have come out we've had two that have come out and you can see there's two on there that looks like a fire inchy and there's one two three still in there there's an inchy in there can you see the inchy pattern so we've got probably another day or two they'll all probably come out of their eggs and then we'll set them up in a shed rub uh, with water so that they can then shed out and then we'll do an update video once everything's out so that's all looking very good and just slip those back wonderful so the other thing is that um, when it comes to um, monitoring your uh, eggs I always have a good look at my eggs on a regular basis I don't necessarily take them out and inspect every egg, but I just watch for condensation, I watch for mould, I watch for um, how the eggs are progressing. And I think it's really wise to have a daily experience just peering in and looking through the windows as to how those eggs are doing so that you can make any adjustments that you need to um, to keep that going. So there's plenty of babies to come, some exciting things ahead. Obviously I want to wish everyone a wonderful Sunday. So we've got the football at 8 o'clock this evening. Hopefully England will come out triumphant and we'll all be celebrating. Um, and also we've got the final of Wimbledon to enjoy. So the Italians are being represented in both finals when I'm half Italian. So it's going to be a wonderful day, Adam. Looking forward to it. And Adam, you're going to be joining us for the footy cool. <laughs> celebration. So I think they've got some treats in. So the whole family were gathering around. My mother was trying to get hold of an Italian um, football shirt. She couldn't get hold of one, but luckily I've got two in my drawer, so we're going to send one over to my mum so she can wear an Italian one. And hopefully there'll be some nice family um, chats going on and we just enjoy the football. But hopefully everyone enjoy and uh, we shall see you next time. So the next video will be, uh, we've got five of our um, last year's grow-ons that have got to size and they're ready to go into their adult rubs. So we'll be featuring under the spotlight five of our beautiful grow-ons making space for these babies. So thanks for joining us and we shall see you next time. Bye bye for now.